Yes, as I was saying, it is a virtual encounter, as you can see, to celebrate Sisway's uh, new book, The New Appetite. Uh, it's an event then, jointly hosted by the Institute of African Studies uh, seminar series um, and the, the reading decolonization in Africa today, which again is a reading group uh, domiciled at uh, IAS UG. On the, on the day, mine is uh, the easiest of task. Um, I will introduce the moderator and then hand over to him uh, to introduce the speakers and the anchor the rest of the proceedings. So Tracy Fleming, uh, formerly Associate Professor of Area and Global Studies at Grand Valley State University, Michigan, USA, now lectures at the University of Environment and Sustainable Development, Somalia in Ghana, uh, in the Department of General Studies in the School of Natural and Environmental Sciences. Uh, he's the author of Travel and the Pan-African Imagination, a book that is actually in press. Um, I hand over to you, uh, Tracy. Uh, thank you very much, Chika. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Okay, so uh, first I'd like to congratulate the author, uh, Dr. Sizwe Mpofu Wash on the publication of the new apartheid. Uh, this is a book that speaks to a scholarly audience as well as to a public audience. Um, the author delineates the process of how a dehumanizing system, uh, what he calls a concept and political philosophy, became embedded in a democratic moment. So first, we will begin this seminar with the author who will speak for 15 minutes. Uh, next, the author will then be followed by the discussants who will take 20 minutes each to respond to the book and the author. And finally, we will then dedicate about 30 minutes to question and answer during which the author will respond to discussants. Afterwards, we will open the floor to participants. Uh, we encourage participants to write questions in the chat box. Um, and at present, due to the size of our audience, uh, for participants who wish to ask questions in person, we ask that you signal your interest by raising your virtual hands. So now we shift to the introduction of the panelists. Um, the author, Sizwe Mpofu Walsh, is a South African author, scholar, media innovator, and musician. He holds a PhD in international relations from Oxford University and currently works as a fellow at the Witts Institute for Social and Economic Research at the University of Witzvodestrand. His first book was on the South, was on South African politics called Democracy and Delusion, 10 Myths in South African Politics, which won the City Press Talber, Tafelberg Award. This book was accompanied by a rap album of the same title. He is the founder of a youth current affairs show called the Sizwe Mpofu Wash Experience. Our next panelist is Mame Adwa Marfo. She is an African feminist creative and activist based in Accra. She is deeply invested in building feminist community and is a co-organizer of the Young Feminist Collective, a group of incredible young women looking to deepen their personal politics and tap into the larger feminist movement space. She is constantly looking for ways to marry her creative, academic, and professional pursuits with her personal politics. She is currently a first year master's student at the University of Ghana's Institute of African Studies. And our Second respondent is prolific S. Mataruse. Dr. Mataruse is a researcher and academic at the University of Zimbabwe in the Department of Governance and Public Management. His research interests are in African political economy, decolonial theory, and community organizing. So at this point, I will turn the floor over to our author, who will have 15 minutes to address our audience. Sizwe, 
Thank you very much, Professor Fleming. And thank you all for taking the time to join this event. It's uh, greatly exhilarating for me to be speaking about this work for the first time, in fact, and it's a very young work outside South Africa. And so I thank all of you for being part of this event. And just before I, I begin in earnest, um, some further acknowledgements to Dr. Mba, to Dr. Mataruse, um, to Mame Adwo Marfo, and to Eric Te uh, Kumado. Thank you all for being a part of this event in various ways, for being interlocutors, um, and for contributing to what I suspect is, is said to be a profoundly uh, fascinating discussion. What I will do in this uh, period of 15 minutes then, um, and thank you very much, of course, to ISUG, is I will try to do just two things. First, I'll introduce the book and try to give you a sense of this work. Um, I'm aware that this work is very new and that many of you may not have had a chance to read it closely or even to read it yet. And so I'd like to give you a feel for the work, a feel for the argument and explain the aims and ambitions of this book and some of, set some of the context. And then having introduced you to the work and given you a sense of the work, its structure and its argument, I'll then read from a section of the work which addresses the conclusion where I try to reflect more broadly on what the situation in South Africa means, both for questions of African politics more generally, but also for questions of democracy itself. And I think those reflections bear more directly, uh, potentially on your context um, in ISUG, um, than a, a parochial and a narrow South African focus. So I'll try to expand on uh, the work's uh, attempts to, to bridge the very specific focus on South Africa's uh, current conjuncture with some of uh, its potential wider implications. So let me begin then with the first part and uh, begin with an introduction um, and try to introduce you briefly to the purpose of, of this work. So the, the book is called The New Apartheid. And just to set the historical context uh, so that I don't take anything for granted, of course, um, in 1910, South Africa or the idea of South Africa is created um, in a British colony, which emerges out of the South African War, also sometimes known as the Anglo-Boer War. And this essentially colonial enterprise evolves and morphs over time into a more and more autonomous, but still white supremacist state. So that by 1948, when the National Party, the party that implemented apartheid as a legislative ideology and ruled for the better part of half a century, comes to power, South Africa is a paradox to the extent that it's a formally independent state, but it is also a deeply colonial state at the same time. And of course, the, the period and the experience of apartheid is a heinous uh, and excruciating experiment in, in human cruelty, racial, gender, and various other forms of engineering um, the history of which I think is well known. And then of course, South Africa inaugurates its democratic order in 1994. It's President Nelson Mandela, the African National Congress sweep to victory in the first democratic elections in 1994. And as the mythology goes, uh, everyone lived happily ever after. What I seek to do in this book, however, is to puncture the binary historical narrative which has pervaded discussions of South Africa since 1994, which sees democratic South Africa, 
as a fundamental different species of political and economic order to its apartheid predecessor. In many ways, what we've created for ourselves in South Africa is an end of history narrative where anything that happens after 1994 is viewed as the afterglow of some democratic miracle. And while it's of course true that many important things have changed in South Africa and that democracy has inaugurated various victories and gains, this over-dramatization of the moment of 1994 as a profoundly liberatory one risks blurring the very sharp and clear resemblances between South Africa in its democratic and constitutional order since 1994 and its apartheid predecessor. And so what I'm trying to do with this work provocatively, um, and it has generated uh, no, shortage of, no shortage of controversy, but also important debate and discussion, is to resuscitate apartheid in South Africa's democratic present and show how it not only lives as a legacy, but has actually adapted around the democratic constraints that were placed for it in 1994, has reinvented itself in key respects, and has ultimately become something of an empire within the private domain of South African life. So in a nutshell, the book argues that apartheid did not die in 1994, but rather it was privatized. And so that when we look at the South African state and its constitutional order, we get the impression that there has been a fundamental rapture from the apartheid past. But when we look in the private realm of life, a realm which extends its reach much more in many ways than the public realm of life, we see not only the preservation, but the reinvention of forms of apartheid. And that's effectively what the book sets out to do. What I'll do just briefly before I come on to the second part, which takes you to the end of the book and some of its conclusions, um, and I'd be more than happy to get into some of the details and the empirical details. What I'd like to do is just give you a, a feel for the argument from the book itself. Um, so I'll just read a few brief extracts. This comes from the introduction, page 13. In this book, I confront apartheid's imminence and eminence in South Africa's present. I trace apartheid's inequities and iniquities beyond 1994. To do this is to suggest that apartheid is more than just a legacy, effigy, or reverberating echo. It is to excavate and disentomb apartheid. It is to search beyond the pomp and pantomime of South Africa's democratic passage into what the poet Lebo Mashile, one of our great poets, calls, quote, the existential crisis of a miracle overstretched. When I say um, that apartheid was privatized, I tried to flesh that out further um, in a long section in the book, um, which I would commend to you, but I'll try to give you a flavor for that section because it's quite central to uh, the arguments I explore in the subsequent chapters. This is from page 17. What does it mean to say that apartheid was privatized? Privatization occurs when state assets or functions are transferred into private hands for private purposes. In this book, I extend this idea to the system of apartheid itself and not just its assets or functions. I claim that apartheid has retreated into the private sphere despite the inauguration of a democratic republic. While the burdensome management of South, Africans, of South Africa's state remains public, power itself has increasingly devolved to the private realm exempt from democratic control. And just a, a final uh, excerpt, what does it mean to say that apartheid was privatized, in part, it means that apartheid was marketized. Apart apartheid was marketized because privilege is now policed by price 
rather than prose. The market, not the state, now dictates the boundaries of opportunity and financial barriers have replaced legal edicts as the key instrument of segregation. Where there is an application, there is a financial regulation. And where there is a financial regulation, there was once a racial law. So that's a sense of the book and its, its aims and its argument. Let me just give you a quick bird's eye view of how the book flows from there. So there's a, an introduction which really lays out the idea of the new apartheid, tries to expound on this notion of apartheid's privatization. And then there are five chapters which look at different realms of South African life. So I try to apply the idea and the theoretical framework of the new apartheid to five areas to assess its theoretical use. And these areas are first space. So I look at space, spatial segregation, uh, both in cities and rural areas in South Africa, and trace the extreme extent of continued segregation, particularly racial segregation in South Africa today. I then move to the question of law. And here I take aim at the idea that South Africa's democratic constitution is capable of overturning the momentum of the new apartheid. I then turn to questions of wealth and I analyze wealth redistribution or one should say lack thereof, uh, wealth concentration dynamics in South Africa since 1994, which are enough to make even the most ardent neoliberal economists eyes pop. I then, and of course those wealth dynamics uh, map onto racial and gendered relations um, and a host of other intersections. So having looked at space, law, and wealth, I then turn to two final chapters. The first um, I look at is one on technology. And this tries to assess the extent to which the digital world has reinforced patterns which were first entrenched in the physical world of 20th century South Africa. And uh, I particularly show that forms of social categorization now uh, possible through our intensely digital lives map onto the forms of social categorization in a South African context that so underpinned apartheid. And then finally, I look at questions of criminal punishment. And here again, I try to reflect on global debates about incarceration and decarceration, but refract them through a very particular South African experience. I show that spectacularly, since 1994, South Africa incarcerates a greater proportion of black people now than it did when blackness was criminalized during apartheid. And this scourge of effectively mass petty incarceration is one of the great stains on South Africa's so-called constitutional miracle. One of the interesting things just, just on that chapter is, is while in many other uh, parts of the globe, the prison industrial complex or the correctional facility uh, system is increasingly privatized. In South Africa, the system is still very much held in public hands, but it has been privatized from within through a series of contracts and uh, a great deal of outsourcing. So that on the one hand, it looks like a public system. And this is, this is key to much of what's happening in South Africa. It looks public, but when you really peer into it, you realize that it's often been hollowed out and privatized from within, and you are, are left with a public shell. So those are the chapters where I tried to look at the new apartheid in South African life. And of course, implicit within that structure is that these forms or these areas of life, law, space, wealth, technology, punishment, also interact and intersect and are key in, in building and sustaining the new apartheid. And then finally, in the conclusion, I reflect on some wider questions and I'll come to that just in the last part of this, of this conversation um, as I keep my eye on the clock. So let me come on to the conclusion which I'd like to read from because on the one hand, 
uh, in the conclusion, I call for a reformation of South Africa's democratic order. I say that South Africa needs to move from its first democratic republic, which was inaugurated in 94, as I said, into a new and second republic. And I make various constitutional proposals in that regard. But then what I try to do in the conclusion as well in a, in a, a further section is reflect on some global questions and reflect on how the experience in South Africa might shed light or at least insight on other patterns. And I'd like to read um, a section from that uh, because I think it captures better my argument than, than, I, can, than I can summarize it here. Um, and so I'll read on page 167. And this is the conclusion and this will also be the conclusion to my talk. A wide variety of contemporary examples reinforce democracy's tolerance for inequality. In Brazil, inequality continues to thrive alongside democracy. And when inequality began to fall in the 2000s, this did not necessarily improve democracy. In Europe and the US, inequality has soared since the 1980s under democracy's cover. In India and Indonesia, the same pattern obtains. And of course, in Southern Africa, inequality has proved impervious to unprecedented democratic transformations in the same period. From the perspective of Southern Africa then, and of course we might in our conversation uh, reflect on various other areas on the continent, concerns about a lack of quote democratic consolidation are misguided. Perhaps rather democracy is simply consolidating in a particularly rapacious form, one which makes democracy compatible with extreme political and economic injustice, one which ironically uses the mythology of democracy to legitimize this rapacity. The problem then is not that Africa is not truly democratic, rather it is that democracy is not democratic where democracy is a byword for equality. African experiences of democracy tell us something about democracy rather than about African aberrants. African democracy has produced ephemeral victories and become, in the words of Claude Ake, a strategy for, quote, a strategy for power, not a vehicle for empowerment, close quote. The South African experience, which continues to confound optimists, is no different. The hard question to be faced then is whether the ANC, the African National Congress, the party that has governed South Africa since 1994, whether the ANC's commitment is to democracy or to power. For if its commitment is to power, then democracy is merely a, conven a convenient mask by which that power gains deceptive legitimacy. This question will produce an answer in the decades to come. Democracy also tolerates state violence. When economic inequality and injustice peak, elites have more to lose in redistribution. The price of repression becomes cheaper than the cost of lost wealth. I'll move on uh, and as I say, conclude on this reading. Um, Southern African experiences confirm this perspective, the, the perspective that democracy is not necessarily always leading to equality. As liberation movements have opted for oppression over redistribution, gross state repression and monstrous inequality should not mystify South Africans. They are fibers in the very fabric of the new apartheid, not unintended outcomes of constitutional wisdom. They are the shadows of a deformed economic order As Ansel and Samuels, another book I would commend um, on the mistaken link between democracy and equality, aver, quote, under democracy, elites do not necessarily need to threaten violence to preserve their standing, as they could simply bribe politicians or otherwise make their wealth indispensable to those who manage government affairs. And they make another provocative argument that bears <clears throat> excuse me, that bears on South Africa's democratic experiment. 
Specifically, they challenge the idea that a growing middle class signals inequalities decline. Instead, they claim that middle class growth may produce rather than threaten inequality. Quote, in developing autocracies, income inequality does not indicate a large middle class, but rather that nearly everyone is equally poor. Income inequality, by contrast, suggests the growth of middle classes, which have strong interests in reining in the expropriative authority of the state. Close quote. So even sizable middle classes can collude with elites rather than renouncing wealth and power. And I end on this paragraph. And this explains a key par paradox of the new apartheid. Many observers argue that South Africa's so-called black middle class endangers inequality. Yet since 1994, inequality has persisted and deepened despite the growth of this class. It follows then that South Africa's persistent inequality under democracy is not puzzling. The black middle class has in is incentivized to side with wealth and power against the impoverished majority. And this is precisely why the apartheid government was intent on creating a black middle class in its final throes, not to reduce inequality, but to preserve it. The idea of inequality itself requires reflection because it has become so central to discourse in South Africa and I see increasingly Ghana. In some ways, inequality is a dangerous term because it decontextualizes injustice. It also numericizes inequity, suggesting a quantitative quandary distinct from everyday life. It breaks links between the past and the present. Hence, equality without justice is futile. Justice without equality is fruitless. South Africa has always been a unique place from which to understand deeper global forces. The new apartheid thus refracts global questions of private power and racial injustice. Apartheid inspired and was inspired by other systems of racial oppression from Germany to Britain and from the US to Australia and Brazil and Southern Africa. Likewise, the new apartheid draws from and influences 21st century racial oppression and neo-colonialism. Therefore, and I end here, if South Africa defeats the new apartheid, it will inspire other nations to contend with white supremacy. If it fails, this will demonstrate white supremacy's resilience. In some respects, South Africa remains a unique experiment in racial injustice. In other ways, it has become more like the rest of the world. South Africa must now reckon with its mundanity and everydayness and abandon its pretensions to exceptionalism. Thanks very much for your time and attention, and I look forward to our conversation and our engagements. Okay, thank you, Sizwe, for that uh, insightful introduction and overview. Um, in the interest of time, we will move to our first um, discussant, uh, um, Mame Adwa Marfo. Um, okay, good morning, everyone. I th good afternoon now, actually. I think what I'm going to do or how I'm going to respond is really by just speaking to the parts of the book or parts of the argument that really struck me and stayed with me and that I've sat with since I finished reading the book. And so I'll begin with the overall focus and I think necessary focus on just how resilient and adaptable si systems of oppression have become in order to preserve the same sorts of power dynamics that have existed and that have pertained for a long time here in Africa and globally as well, and how they transform themselves in order to preserve sort of the status quo, whether that's openly or implicitly or insidiously. Um, also the ways in which systems of power are linked necessarily to the issues of access, especially economic access and access to resources and how the lack of access sort of doubles down on and deepens the ways in which people are marginalized within society 
in South Africa, but also just generally in Africa. And there's a part of the book where it speaks specifically to issues of language and definitions. So I, I think I question all the time, or I think through all the time, who constructs definitions, especially where the words are to do with oppression, um, who has control of how those things are defined, who is able to freeze them, who is able to reattribute them as and when they choose, and how do they limit or broaden what those terms mean? And I think it's flexible and it changes. Um, speaking specifically about racism or sexism or colonialism and imperialism, I would say we freeze those words or people freeze those words sometimes in a very particular historical context. And what that does is to disempower oppressed people invoking them in the present because it isn't necessarily as obvious or as in your face or as um, sort of as extreme as it once was. So it cannot qualify to be called the same thing when many of the principles are preserved and many of the same ideas are being reproduced and sustained. Um, calling a thing a thing is something that I think is, is an act of bravery and calling something by its name is both brave and essential in the look in in the efforts to deconstruct and dismantle it and so invoking apartheid dr Mpufu walsh actually says in the book is something that he doesn't do lightly and so i appreciate the courage and the bravery intellectually of taking that step and naming it what it is in order to fully acknowledge and then move towards a place where it's possible to deconstruct and take it apart and truly really analyze it for what it is um, the issue of color blindness and you know blindness to difference, race blindness, gender blindness, and whether or not that it that has a place in the discourse about how we respond to oppression, I think also really struck me and sat with me. Because when we think of gender blindness, a lot of people assume that that is the ideal situation where we don't see difference. Whereas not seeing difference, you are erasing identity. And so is the answer to oppression erasure, or is the answer to oppression a full acknowledgement of that difference and persisting within that difference to argue for equity? Um, things that are gender blind and race blind and blind to power dynamics and power imbalance don't necessarily redress that imbalance, they ignore it and then help that balance, that imbalance story to continue and to persist. And I think that's an argument that the book makes quite strongly and that I, I've been sitting with since I read the book. There's also an implicit understanding and acceptance of intersectionality and the different ways in which the intersections that people exist within affect their lived experiences and affect the ways in which they relate to each other and the complexities of shifting power dynamics depending on context while still understanding that within the larger structure, certain groups are definitely privileged or have access to a certain kind of structural privilege. So I appreciated the understanding of, you know, how race and class and sex and gender and sexuality constantly intersect and how people's lived experiences are impacted by the fact that they live within different intersections of different identities and live at the intersections of different axes of oppression. Um, thinking about historical narratives and our relationships to them, I think I sat with the fact that a lot of the history that was presented in the book was problematized rather than simplified. And so there are lots of areas where, and for, for good reason, people, people present a fairly romanticized view of the leaders that we have loved or the people who have played important roles in liberation efforts and in the independence effort. And even if I'm going to push that argument further back, a romanticization of pre-colonial Africa in a particular way, which is of course to combat an existing narrative, which is necessarily overly negative and overly critical of African societies before the colonial intrusion, but also understanding that that narrative or that over romanticization doesn't do anyone any good and doesn't really help us to unpack the truth of the situation that we find ourselves in. And so I was particularly struck by how problematized the narratives were 
and also how that impacted the understanding of what a deconstruction of the system would look like or what a deconstruction of the system would be looking to do because then there is a sort of past, present and future orientation that looks at the past and the truth of it in order to understand the peculiar sort of circumstances of the present and understand where without intervention, the future may lead, but also understand why and how the past has led us to the place in which we are. Um, and decolonizing, I think, since I came to the Institute is something that I've had to think about in pretty much all of my, my classes and outside of class time, if I'm honest. But looking at it as a project that isn't necessarily focused on restoring a pre-colonial utopia, but that looks at what is beautiful about our past and what has been repressed about our past, understands our present and looks to what is possible for us and looks to what we can become independent of with a full understanding of what the past was and the present is, but necessarily independent of sort of the limitations and the bounds of prior knowledge, just what is possible for an Africa that chooses to decolonize itself, what is possible for a Ghana that chooses to move towards a full and more complete articulation of a decolonized nation state. Um, there's a part about secret negotiations that I think was part of um, my, understanding of a more problematized independence process. And I'm a musical theater fan. So it reminded me of Aaron Burr's part in a Hamilton where he says, we want our leaders to save the day, but we don't get to say in what they trade away and how we dream of a brand new start, but we dream in the dark for the most part because there are parts of the independence struggle that to me felt public. We saw speeches, we saw clashes, we understood the rhetoric they interfaced with the public in a particular way, but there was also a part of the independence process that was fully based on negotiations that the public didn't necessarily have the same sort of access to. And so it is that public private dichotomy, even back then in what, what was traded and what was done and what was said outside of public view and what was ceded and what was given and what was taken versus sort of the general public feeling and sentiment and how that was also a part of the struggle. I appreciated the idea of a re-examination of South Africa's constitution. Um, interestingly enough, there have been calls and sort of talk about Ghana also going through its own um, re-examination and sort of review of the constitution that we're working with and on now, um, but also the understanding that that constitutional review isn't the end or be all of a process that would dismantle what the new apartheid actually looks like, I think was particularly interesting to me because for most people, once the political restructuring is done, the assumption is that then we function with a society that's broken free of that mold. But that wouldn't necessarily be a truth and I found it, I found it striking that the book acknowledged that openly I'm looking at racial biases as they were embedded in technology in one of the chapters I thought was also particularly striking because it's something that I don't think we're always super aware of, even though technology is such an essential and integral part of the way we live life in today's world. Talking about algorithmic predictions, talking about surveillance, talking about data extraction, but also thinking sometimes about even the more mundane ways in which racial biases are part of the technology we use. Even on social media, there was a point in time where on Twitter, if you had a picture full of white people, their faces would be cropped into the shot. And if you had a, fit, a picture full of black people, their faces actually wouldn't be cropped into the shot because it wasn't, the algorithm wasn't structured to recognize black faces or was structured to recognize white faces. Even thinking sometimes about like, sanitizer sensors that don't respond to black skin because they weren't trained with the data to respond to black skin properly. And things that just, in the way that the world is being built and shaped and changed even today, that racial biases are implicit and are embedded into things that we aren't necessarily always aware that they're embedded into. I think in the privatization argument, Dr. Puff Walsh already spoke very clearly about the marketization, thinking about it as a financial process, but also thinking about the intrusion of the state into the most private aspects 
of people's lives, the domestic space, thinking about people's sexual activity, sexual preferences, sexual orientation, and also thinking about women's bodies. I think through time, women's bodies have always existed as a site of oppression, a site of legislation, and also a site of resistance. And I think I would probably be remiss if I didn't link this somehow to the LGBTQIA plus bill that's been um, entered into parliament as we speak, that's sort of in the now people are discussing and have been discussing for the past few months. Um, the ideas of the state having sexual control over people, being able to talk to how people identify and legislate against that and criminalize it as well is overreach in my opinion, it's problematic. But speaking specifically to the apartheid context, how sexual control laws and the ideas of rape laws really were different along racial lines. And I think there are parallels here with some of the arguments that Kimberly Crenshaw makes in her seminal paper about intersectionality because chastity is assumed of white women and so their sexual behavior is policed in order to protect them, whereas promiscuity is assumed of black women. And so their sexual behavior is policed and not in order to protect them, but in order to protect white women from their advance, white men, sorry, from their advances. And so how looking at the same thing about sexual violence and looking at the same axis of gender, the interaction and intersection of race changes the interpretation. Um, thinking also about femicide, which is mentioned in the book, and I would be remiss without mentioning it here because just yesterday was the two year anniversary of Uyinene's death and also the day that a memorial was organized for Nosy Sellers. So that, those are very much um, issues that I think close to me and dear to my heart, where women's, women's oppression on multiple axes is doubled down on and to a certain extent permitted by the state and almost encouraged by a larger societal understanding of what women's bodies are and who they belong to and how women's bodies should be treated and how women as people or not as people and as property should be treated. I think even in Ghana, marital rape laws, which I also mentioned in the, which I also mentioned in the book, took a long time to be put into our criminal code and to be criminalized, or the idea that a married woman could be raped was something that took a while for people to come around to because of the dominant understanding of marriage under patriarchal sort of repression. Um, I'll conclude with some of the questions that I think I've been sitting with for a long time, but that I think I'm still sitting with, and that the conversation that the book both starts and carries on has left me sort of mulling on and mulling around is how we center sort of the most marginalized members of society in the work that we do, and how in the dismantling of a system that is necessarily dismantled because of what it does and how it functions to disempower people and to marginalize people, how do we ensure that in the reconstruction, we are centering very much the people whose voices are most marginalized? Um, how do we ensure that we aren't reproducing similar power imbalances or actually producing newer imbalances of our own as we work towards this newer, better, more equitable, world or more equitable country or more equitable continent, how do we make sure that we're centering the people who are the most marginalized at every step of the process, I think is something that I've been thinking through and about. And that isn't necessarily something that Dr. Mpufu Walsh even has to answer because I don't know that it's a question that's just a straightforward answer, but it's just, I think, what the book has left me thinking about. So yeah, I'll end here. Thank you all so much for your time and attention. Thank you very much, Mame Adwa Marfo, for that uh, excellent engagement. We will turn to our final respondent, Dr. Prolific S. Masaruse. Thank, uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's a, it's a fascinating book. And I think the responses as well so far have been, um, have been extremely fascinating responses today and responses on social media, 
responses on Twitter. I saw Dr. Walsh tweeting today about um, his response from Mark Gibson. Um, it's really a book that's written with a it's really a book that's written with a sense of uh, a sense of agents. Um, and I'm proud that um, he carries that agency from even his activist days um, uh, at UCT. And I think that's important somehow. It's something that caught my attention that he, as a young person, he, he has not yet succumbed to compromises and explanations and reasons that can be given to accept, uh, you know, things that are, are indecent and um, that are retained um, oppression. So um, there's a quote that I like, that I like, that I think captures kind of agents that is, uh, that permeates the book. Um, all of it in, in particular, this quote from um, Kotsia. So there is this reason to, there is this reason to reopen the coffin and remind ourselves of what apartheid looks like in the flesh. Um, you know, it's a graphic um, imagery. You need to open the, open the coffin, relook at something um, for you to understand what it is. And I think he really does that. And he does that by focusing on um, a thesis that's that's simple, that's so straightforward, that apartheid was privatized, you know. Um, and the way he maps the idea of the privatization, for me, it's something that's that's important and relevant even for my own context here in Zimbabwe. And I think for many other African countries, the way he pursues uh, this privatization in terms of space, in terms of wealth, in terms of punishment, and the other themes that are uh, that are in the book. It's so, it's so, it's so profound, it's so profound. Um, these are things sometimes that you take for granted when you visit a place, when you're in a place, but then when you begin to think and see from, uh, from the way that he has been looking uh, at things, you actually get to look at your surroundings and think about things um, in a very, uh, in a very critical, in a very critical way. So, um, the one idea that really stands out for me is the um, autopoietic nature of operation. How operation is able to survive, how it is able to reproduce, you know, to regurgitate, to adapt. And I think it's something that's that's important, you know. So in our case here in Zimbabwe, we removed Mugabe in 2017. In 2018, in 1980, we had removed White, and in 2017, we removed Mugabe. You know. But operation still, still, still maintains. But when I went through the book and looking at privatization, and eventually the bigger argument that I'll talk to eventually about democracy that he talks to, you, I think you actually begin to see a, a pattern flow that is very structural, that is fixed within within the system, whether in Zimbabwe, in South Africa, in Nigeria, in Ghana, you know, in other African countries, there is a basic problem with the very system itself. Or sometimes we take things for granted and hope that if we adopt certain systems, certain approaches, the systems will definitely deliver uh, by themselves. But um, it doesn't happen. So I also like something that it does with the idea of local government. How you know local government still remains very much um, a territory for extending uh, forms of oppression um in in very practical ways so this is actually the tentacles of uh, um uh, of colonialism still still remain very much uh, at local government level when i was looking at parallels between south africa and in my own case here in zimbabwe i've seen that the same laws that still applied back then in the creation of the pakistans uh, in how to administer um the rural and um, Urban areas, you still find almost the same thing is replicated, was maintained as is. Uh, so in that in that in in that discussion of space and local government, he then begins to talk about the explicit and in and, um, and the internal. That sometimes in the past we used to easily identify oppression because it was so explicit, it was external, but now it's it has adopted. A subtle ways, you know, where people, some people live in catered communities, some people cannot approach, cannot walk in certain uh, public spaces because of uh, certain uh, insidious, certain hidden um, um, 
uh, ethos that has been in, um, inherited. So instead of that um, bad, um, you, you know, an explicit kind of uh, oppression, you find this kind of oppression is, a, is the one that requires someone to step back and look. Uh, something that I that I that I liked is your expression, Dr. Walsh, of uh, when you said there is something striking, strikingly different, and yet at the same time strikingly similar about the apartheid and the new and the new apartheid, which is something that people have really agreed about that there is something wrong with South African um, the polity in general. So even the book reveals that uh, he gave come out point out that there is something definitely wrong and people are calling it new apartheid. You call it new apartheid and you do it so well. You even describe the extent of the of the of the new of the new of the new um of the new apartheid. But what you do and probably what probably um, many people ask you to grasp and what we probably still have to understand more is your question um of uh, of how then do you confront systems that continue to reproduce themselves. I'm reminded of uh, Richard Peter's um, um, uh, statement when he says uh, that South Africa has bought a colony in the post, in the post colony, you know, a situation where um, a poverty and opulence can, 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 can coexist. How do you deal with, with such a system that, that has the ability to continue to come back? And there's been a bit of discussion on, on your proposals on what you do, because you dismiss a lot of things. And I think you dismiss those things uh, after, uh, after thinking uh, deeply about them. And I think from our own experiences in our own country, it, these are things that are very, very important. Constitutional changes alone, uh, amendments, um, you know, do not sometimes do it. And you, 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 you even suggest that grant policy shifts not be enough. Uh, then you go on to tackle the, the question of the laws itself, in terms of the constitution, what needs to, to change within the constitution. And you're calling for a new republic in South Africa, a radical reconstitution, at some point you even call it a revolution um, within, uh, within South Africa. And I think this is where you, you really um, nailed it, because you first exhumed the body and showed us the body. And now you are showing us the process of healing. Um, it's saying, how really can we tackle this? And it's it's brave to say we need to, we need a revolution. We need to 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 see how elections are conducted because the electoral system still ensures that a particular political party only decides who, who is president. You are opting. You are calling for um, a first pass the post situation where everyone gets to vote for the president. Um, and I think those are very strong. Um, and at some point, uh, suggestions that border on even idealistic uh, sense, uh, but still, I think these are things that um, are worth thinking about and are worth suggesting. I like how you say that there is a problem. Then, when people begin to think that this is the only way that um, that that can happen, that the constitution as is is should stay like that, should be uh, probably slightly tinkered with. But you are suggesting that no, we need to actually radically reconstitute. And you offer for the South African state um, in the reader, you offer um, significant suggestions as to what can change from the constitution uh, going out. But I also like how you distinguish yourself uh, from uh, from um, from people that from other people that are calling for the for the constitution in total, and you insist that you believe in the constitution. But you are saying we want the best. We want a constitution that delivers a dignity for people, aspirations, freedom for people. And I think this is something that's that probably you you pick from your your other books, Democracy and, uh, uh, and Delusions. I think it's a book that I'll also be interested in reading because it's something that's so that's so 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 fundamental. How do you practically deal with the problems of uh, of democracy? How do you deal with the problems of wealth, wealth which still remains within uh, um, certain hands, um, and sometimes there are piecemeal, uh, piecemeal resolutions, uh, piecemeal, um, piecemeal um, gifts 
to, to the middle class. It's a question that that is really very, very imperative and important for, for not just um, South Africa. I also like something that you, you, you rightfully draw at attention to in the conclusion, that South Africa is a unique case in terms of identifying global deficiencies, forces uh, that are functioning at a global level. They are particularly manifest within, 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 within South Africa. Um, and you, you, you highlighted that in 1910, the concept of South Africa was formed. Uh, so you find, you find that it was, the, it was the place where sort of colonization really began from, because people were coming and stationing uh, in, uh, in, in South Africa and moving into the interior of, uh, of, uh, uh, of Southern Africa. But if you notice, it's, it's, it's the place that still remains like the colonial outpost. When, in terms of uh, the other Southern African countries, the, the, the kind of freedom that they is, is in independence is probably much better as compared to, uh, to the kind of uh, decolonization that, that happened within South Africa. And it shows how stubborn in, the particular, in South African, um, in South Africa, uh, white supremacist um, colonization uh, still, um, uh, uh, Still remains, but you highlight for us that the technology of this um, resurgence and this adaptation is privatization, and this is a very important idea generally for Africa. You know, with COVID nineteen, people are talking about uh, uh, SDRs uh, from the IMF. Zimbabwe received one billion from the IMF. Uh, Yesterday, you know, many other African countries are bound to receive a lot of things from the uh, from the uh, international financial institution. But also, this brings about how privatization continues to mutate, even in in situations where um, whiteness has sort of disappeared from uh, uh, from uh, from the physical landscape. You know, in Zimbabwe, it's almost rare to come across that in uh, white people in general. Um, since the land reform. So, but still the operation, the very patterns. And this is very uh, much highlighted in the geography. Uh, your maps that you bring out uh, in, 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 in sketching out the resemblance between the colonial time and the present time, it's so, it's so, it's so staggering. And by that, you then bring out how the old patterns are retained, but within an insider, with an insider kind of art. In South Africa, it's done amidst uh, racial diversity. In, country, in other countries in Southern Africa and probably elsewhere, you find there is there isn't that kind of diversity in terms of uh, uh, of uh, of uh, races, you know, you know. But still, you find the same thing is so is so stable. Same thing is inside. And I think the question of what then should be um, should be done is a question that still that still that still um, uh, begs you know uh, to, to be answered more. And I think it is probably a subject for your next projects. How do we really address this thing? So for, for people that that are that are still to read the book. There are some quotations as well, some things that I found um, in some ways that I found very much um, to be good diction, um, vocabulary, you know, for thinking around, around uh, these kind of continuities from, um, from systems of oppression. Uh, you talk about afterlives, you know, afterlives. How do these things live after? How are they distorted? How are they duplicated? How do they reappear? How do they disguise? How are they disguised? You talk about how are they preserved within, within constitutions, that is within laws. But you, you, you still come back to, to um, the new thinker or the new person that's, um, uh, that's, uh, that's confronting oppression either because they are within a system of, uh, of oppression or they are trying to think um, of how other people can come out of out of oppression, you are saying to us that it's never going to be inevitable. Um, it's never going to be um, um, inevitable. It's something that also must never be, uh, you know, uh, simplified. 
it's they, they, they can never be simple answers to these things. It cannot be inevitable. It cannot be simplified. You, we have to grapple with the crisis. We have to grapple with the situations, and I think that's that's an important that's an important that's an important take from the book. No idea, no ideal can just deliver on its own, and this is, I think, your critical edifice when um, talking about democracy. When you actually say that democracy can coexist with uh, uh, with um, with inequality, there's another quote again that I'll repeat here. Um, democracy and inequality are not only compatible, but often mutually reinforced, mutually reinforcing that democracy can actually be a face. This is something that you read about. Um, you, you read um, when you gave your your, your introduction. Uh, to us in the book, you spoke more about inequality and how inequality still uh, stays. But I also like how the staying power of that inequality, you highlight how it can destabilize uh, nations, in particular taking the, the nature of crime and your proper depictions of crime, that crime sometimes is, is, is misread within the South African context. But also, I think generally, in terms of conflict um, across 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 Africa, because if inequality is left to stay, if inequality is left to fester, the wounds that that it causes eventually lead to issues that are probably at some point nasty, but also to transformational possibilities. And you highlight roads must fall. A bit of history you talk about it in 2015. And, uh, uh, and, um, and the significance uh, in terms of uh, the transformation, um, the transformational possibilities and how a, a certain generation began to question um, what she had been received as, as wisdom, as, as success, that uh, to quote your, to quote you at some point, uh, in terms of um, um, the poet, um, I'm forgetting the name of the poet, but you are saying, that a miracle overstretched. You are talking of a miracle that's been overstretched, and that this particular juncture in uh, South Africa, in South, Af in South Africa, and probably in African in African history, and even in global history, um, when you look at situations with Brexit, the UK uh, protests in the uh, in the US, uh, you know, in Greece and other countries, you actually see that probably it's it's a high time to really find people that grapple with, with the question uh, from, from its roots. Uh, and its roots being in, uh, in economic terms, its roots being in ideational terms, its roots being in, 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 in an intersectional complex rather than a monolithic um, kind of complex where you are urging us to, to, to think. You, you talk about past, not about the past, but about past. You talk about presence. You know, but multiple presence. You talk about um, futures. These are these are realms that probably, in thinking about greater, greater, greater um, uh, freedom, greater um, standards of living for for Africans uh, and people, general humanity. You know, we need to adopt much more complex worldviews than just um, you know, simple, simple simple perspectives. I, I'm, I think I'll stop here uh, for now, but I'll be happy to read the other book, your first book on democracy and religions, because I think when you concluded, there was a sense in me that I think you were continuing your thoughts from the other book, and I think you are on to another book again, um, in particular with democracy. And I think this is, this is new thinking that you are, you are, you are bringing, uh, you are making, uh, People see that rather than being an aberration, that Africa is is an aberration in terms of uh, uh, the kind of patterns of uh, politics and economics that are happening within within the um, African condition. They are actually um, a systemic uh, uh, reproduction of a of a global and historical pattern that needs to be present and needs to be present uh, created. Uh, over to you, Chairperson. Terrific. Thank you very much for that insightful um, discussion of the author's text. Um, we are 
we have less than 20 minutes remaining. So I would like to give the author an opportunity to briefly respond to the discussants and that I request we take the remaining time to have the author respond to questions that audience members have entered into the chat box. Excuse me. Hello, Sizwe, are you there? Thanks. Yes, you're welcome. I'm here. I'm here. Thanks. Thanks so much, uh, Professor Fleming. Um, yes. What a staggering set of reflections on this book. I think quite the best set of reflections I've yet heard on this work. Um, and uh, I started with a sense of exhilaration and that only accelerated as I heard the responses. Um, I couldn't possibly do justice to them in the time we have, but I'll try to, even if telegraphically, reflect on, accentuate, um, and respond to uh, as much as I can um, while, I, while I keep an eye on, on the clock. Um, but let me just say both to um, Mame Adwo Marfo, um, as well as, as Dr. Mataruse, thank you for the deep engagement with this work. And what's wonderful, uh, just, to, just to break out of the reflection on the actual substance for a moment, is, is to focus on the journey of, of writing a book. Is, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. You either intentionally or unintentionally forget your work um, as soon as you're done with it. And then when it comes out for public consumption, there are rare moments when others reflect your work back at you and you remember it anew. And I very much got that sense listening to the reflections, um, uh, remembering why, why I wrote this work and hearing it connect um, and, and be taken in new directions was, was fascinating. So thank you to both of you for, for those brilliant reflections, um, which, which, which uh, enhance the work in and of themselves. Let me just begin with, with uh, reflecting on the first part. Um, and let me just accentuate, because I think even the themes which you brought out are, are worth reflecting on again and again. Firstly, the resilience and adaptability of oppressive systems, and, and I, I love the phrasing. Then questions of language, but not just at a superficial level, but questions of the construction of meaning, of radical semantics, as it were, and the politics of semantic and linguistic power. Um, in framing what can and cannot be said, can and cannot define, be defined in a particular time is a crucial one for us. The question of colorblindness and the paradox of attempting to create a future which hasn't yet emerged and how we get to a future where we, we wish that difference isn't vested with ethical or uh, oppressive connotations. Yet we cannot ignore the very presence of difference at the same time and, and how we try to bridge an ideal future with a very uh, complex present, crucial um, and worth reflecting on as we, go, as we go forward. Questions of history and time. And I just loved this idea, which I had never thought of, of the romanticization of liberatory leaders mirroring our own romanticization of pre-colonial Africa and how our inability to engage in self-critique limits us from summoning the political imagination we need to transcend um, our conjuncture. Is, is, is so fundamental and seems to capture what it is that we need right now across multiple places and, and spaces on the continent. 
questions of intersectionality and the quote multiple axes of oppression on which they rest. I ha have been very keen in this work um, to bring those out without announcing that I am now entering onto the chapter on intersectionality, or I am now going to have the section on intersectionality, which I think in many ways is actually uh, self-defeating. Although it does raise the debate, it also, it also relegates the debate to its own separate section when the entire point, as I see it, of an intersectional analysis is to bring it in to the center and to make it a lens throughout a work. Um, and this is something that I do try to do um, and the reader will determine the extent of its, of its success, but something that I think is fundamental going forward, um, that an intersectional lens doesn't have to be explicitly announced in order to underpin a work. Um, questions of technology as well to flag, but also a wonderful discussion uh, picking up on the way that gender functions in this work. And just, just to reflect finally, and, and as I can say, I can only do grave injustices to the, to the complexity with, with which the, the interventions were made. What was fascinating for me was the extent to which apartheid is often seen as a system of racial segregation and oppression, and surely it is. But the extent of gendered engineering and the extent of control over people's intimate sexual lives, not only in the realm of sexuality, but also in the realm of intimate relationships and often in the, in the bridges between those two. Apartheid was deeply concerned with, with forging certain sexual, gendered and racial identities all at once under the mask merely of a racial project. There was a deep underlying project of, of engineering, which has been imported into the present moment. And in South Africa's current atrocious crisis of what can only be described as a war on women, many of the multiple toxic masculinities which have been forged in the past have mutated and metastasized into the present. And the democratic order has also shielded that dramatic process of evolution from view in its, in its moment of celebration. So thank you very much for, for all of your comments, which I uh, enjoyed greatly. And then uh, Dr. Mataruse, um, as I say, much of what you've discussed, I've also touched on as well, but some things that I would like to accentuate before closing is this idea of autopoiesis that you, that you bring out, which I define early in the book, um, and I think is an important definition to consider. The property of a living system, such as a bacterial cell or a, or a multicellular organism that allows it to maintain and renew itself by regulating its composition and conserving its boundaries. And an interesting term from biology, which I think is useful in, in, in the traps we set for ourselves where we think we have invented our way out of problems, but we only find them in renewed ways once we do that. What I can say, even though I, I couldn't possibly solve, and, and I do think that this work points in a direction of a, of a new attempt at answering these questions of how, which have emerged from both the responses, and I think it's something that should engage us deeply, is that at least we now know that we need to contend with something that is living and adaptive, and that our solutions to one problem, which may seem seductive, need to, to, to be several steps ahead of the way that problem itself might evolve into the future. And I think approaching pragmatic questions of how we extricate ourselves from these self-replicating systems of oppression must be done at least with that wisdom uh, in mind and the realization that 
these systems of oppression are so all encompassing that unless there is a certain simultaneity of action and a certain simultaneity of response, just as there was simultaneity in the, in the creation of these systems. I mean, apartheid within 10 years has remade life, space, wealth, education, healthcare, uh, people's intimate relationships all at once. And so if we merely focus on one brick in this larger wall, then all the other bricks will simply just keep the wall intact. And so there needs to be uh, an act of urgent simultaneous action all at once in a very specific direction for a concerted time. Um, and summoning the imagination for that, let alone the, uh, the, the energy for its implementation is a multi-generational project, one which, you know, very few human communities have ever actually executed, but that is what we are called to do. And unless we appreciate the scale of, of that project, then we will forever be surprised by the reinventions of the oppressions around us. Um, so thank you for highlighting that important uh, aspect of, of the work. It's an aspect which is fundamental to the work which you, you have raised. And, and then finally, uh, just in, in closing, um, the disappearance of white people. Or we might extend that to the, the disappearance of explicit forms of oppression. And how that doesn't mean the disappearance of, of white supremacy. Even when uh, white people actually leave, whiteness and various other forms of oppression have already done the work they need to do. And in fact, it's deceptive that their lack of presence actually uh, lulls us into a false sense of security. And this is exactly what's happened in South Africa and in many other parts, that in that complacency, we fail to realize that there's an adaptive and a, and a reinventive logic to the systems which, which no longer need human agency to self-replicate. Uh, once again, uh, Dr. Mataruse, uh, thank you very much. Um, Mame uh, Adwo Marfo, thank you very much for a, a wonderful set of reflections um, about which I'll be, I'll be uh, mulling for a very long time. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Siswe. Um, because we're running out of time and we have several questions, I will um, pose several questions um, to you as delineated by our participants and you have the option of choosing to answer them um, in whatever fashion you deem best. Uh, the first one is, what is your take on the idea that Mandela negotiated a bad deal for the South Africa poor and subsequent leaders like Zuma might just be victims and perpetuators of bad system? In other words, how can South Africa change without going the way of Zimbabwe? Another uh, question is, as follows, the notion of apartheid as having disappeared with the elections that brought Mandela to power is interesting. How does your book help us to understand A, what happened to Thabo and Becky at Polo Kwane and the trajectory of the ruling ANC since then? B, the Marikana massacre and C, the xenophobic violence and violence against women? Oh, I'm sorry, and D, the recent riots in KwaZulu Natal and other places. Another question is, how does the thesis of a privatized apartheid account for the evolution of Black solidarity from around the continent to Black persecution witnessed in the waves of attacks directed at African migrants in South Africa? Another question is, how does new apartheid explain the current predicament of modern African states, especially as regards private control and hold on the state uh, another question is, would I, be, would I be right to say that the new apartheid is as much a Nigerian, Ghanaian, or even Zimbabwean uh, phenomena as it is South African? Uh, and finally, I'll take the liberty of adding one of my own questions is, what do you think of the Afrocentric scholars who argue that white people fear genetic annihilation, perhaps most uh, best articulated by the late Dr. Frances Cress Wilson and her theory of color confrontation and white supremacy, which she equates with racism. Suzwe. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Um, 
Yes, what I will try to do then is point people to parts in the book which I think respond to some of these questions um, and then just reflect on, on a few of them. Um, so let me do that before I come to the, the substantive questions. Um, what happened to Meki and the trajectory of the ANC um, is something that I've covered quite extensively in my first book, Democracy and Delusion. And so that's a real take on the Zuma era in South Africa. Um, and I would, I would suggest you uh, have a look at that. Um, the thesis of privatized apartheid, black solidarity during apartheid with the, the way that uh, shamefully black African migrants have been some of the greatest victims of the new apartheid. Um, I reflect on this in quite some depth in the book and effectively what I say, and this is in the introduction, is that one of the tragedies of the new apartheid in comparison with apartheid itself is that uh, various oppressions have been turned on history's innocent bystanders as South Africa uh, tries to extricate itself from the new apartheid. And so those who perpetrate the new apartheid have receded further and further from view and tragically, uh, those who had nothing to do with creating apartheid oppression have suddenly become some of the worst victims of the new apartheid itself. Um, and so there are great divergences uh, and great tragedies about Black solidarity with Black South Africa and how Black South Africa and South Africa in general has responded to Black African migrants. Um, in terms of uh, the question that Mandela sold out, that's one I'd, I'd like to give a longer answer to. And this has been a, an ongoing debate in South Africa since about 1994. And so you're right to raise it. I tend to think the debate has reached something of a dead end. And this is the reason for it. Firstly, it centers Mandela in, in, an, in a hugely complex moment. Um, Secondly, it centers the ANC in a hugely complex moment. And what we do when we do that is we end up erasing apartheid at the negotiating table and assume that Mandela had all the power and agency. Um, what I think is a more fruitful and productive way of framing the question is what did the negotiators of apartheid's exit from the political stage want? And what did they get? In other words, let's not worry about whether Mandela sold out or not. Let's question whether apartheid negotiators had a plan and a vision for a democratic South Africa. And to what extent does that democratic South Africa resemble the hope of the apartheid negotiators? And I think when we do that, we realize that in some ways, the ANC scored certain victories that it thought were important at the time, but have subsequently turned out to be hollower than they imagined. At the same time, those negotiating apartheid knew full well South Africa would become a democracy. And they knew that even if South Africa was a democracy, they would be able to preserve various forms of apartheid. And what I conclude in the book is that Ultimately, the ANC, whether out of premeditation or uh, a lack of foresight, was outmaneuvered in various important ways. But berating them for this just deflects us from appreciating that unless we attack the vision of the new society uh, espoused by the apartheid negotiators, um, we, we, we will simply be chasing our tails, um, pointing fingers at uh, only a partial uh, set of actors who have left South Africa where it is. Um, and then I'm afraid I'm going to have to end on, on a note of ignorance um, because I'm, I'm completely unfamiliar with the arguments on gender um, and racial, I, I believe it was actual, was it uh, racial extinction? Um, so while I'm, while I'm familiar with the Afrocentric tradition, um, I, I'm just not familiar with those arguments. And so I'll have to look at them 
um, and perhaps in, in future thinking and, and maybe even work, reflect on how they, how they bear on my, on my argument. Um, but hopefully uh, offline and after this, I'd love to get in touch with, with everyone. Please do reach out to me and, and, uh, and Professor, um, I, I would very much like to continue that, that conversation, Professor Fleming, um, when I know more about it. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much. This has been a very exciting um, seminar. Um, we'd like to thank all of our participants um, um, for their um, engagement and as well as our audience members. At this moment, in the interest of time, I will turn it over to our organizer, Dr. Chika Imba. Thank you, uh, Professor Fleming. Thank you, everyone, for creating the time. And uh, thank you, Professor Fleming, for thanking everyone. Um, we will come back with another um, important, interesting event in the coming week at the same time. Join us then. All the best. You can unmute and say hi to everyone, and then we can go. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Hello, Again. everyone. Hi. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, is there any chance we could take a, a picture? Everyone. Or a screenshot? Sure. <laughs> uh, Chica? Is it possible to take a picture? Oh, uh, is that? I've never, <laughs> I don't know how, how that works. <laughs> I think it was a screenshot of the uh, gallery view. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh yeah. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Yeah.